Good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this resource and community where our goal is to help you develop a habit of getting into Scripture every day. It's a worthwhile habit, but we know it's not an easy one. So we show up and say, well, we'll help you, right? My name is Rebecca Palmatier. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit, and I say welcome. Welcome. It's an honor to get to get into Scripture with you and hopefully be a resource and an aid to you. I'm going to go ahead and real quick just um, jump on and share. Usually we don't go live on Wednesdays. Uh, at least that's what it's been for the past school year. But we didn't get to finish yesterday. And so I thought, you know what, we're going we're gonna to do it. It's this summer. We can, we can change things up. Here we go. I'm going to share Jesus' burial and Joseph. Oh. I just typed, good morning, Gloria. I typed in, we're going to talk about Joseph of Arimathea. And I quickly hit send and I realized, uh, spelling spell check changed it to joseph of aromatherapy so <laughs> let me go real fast and fix that because that's weird edit <laughs> a-r-i-m-a-t-h-e-a -A. there it is all right good morning gloria good morning okay Let's go ahead and let's pray. I know we have friends that are starting to come in. So let's pray and then we will, uh, we'll get started. Because it, it's the last part of the chapter. There's not a ton of verses, but there's a lot that we can discuss about behind the scenes significant stuff. So let's do it. <sighs> Good morning, Lord. Good morning. Ah, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the way that you love us, Lord, beyond what we deserve. Thank you that we have your presence and your spirit with us wherever we go. Hmm. Help us receive your word. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's do it. Here we go. It's the Gospel of Mark here with the Scripture Habit. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited for our discussion today. Here we go. Um, let me know as you're coming in, by the way, or if you're watching the replay. Good morning, Karen. Like Karen, hi, honey. I'm excited about today's scripture because there's a lot of information or awareness behind the scenes that makes this moment even more significant. And we're also going to overlay um, two other gospel accounts about this guy that's mentioned today, Joseph of Arimathea. So let's get started. Picking up where we left off yesterday, verse 40 says, there were also women watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and the younger, I'm sorry, James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women followed him and took care of him Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. Hey, Bonnie, good morning. And Rhonda, good morning. The account here, it's significant because they are leaning into the eyewitness account of women. And back then, that wouldn't, like, this, you know, the details that Mark includes, like, with all of the Gospels in this moment, it is to validate, it's to give extra awareness as to the reality of the details as they happened, right? Eyewitness accounts matter. In that society, the eyewitness of, an, of a woman would not have had as much bearing as a man because of their society. And yet still, um, one would say in, in defense of the accuracy of the Gospels, they 
They continue to point to the women because that's what happened. They're not make they're not making anything up. Like so, even in moments where you know someone that might have been trying to craft a alternate narrative, they wouldn't have done this. They wouldn't have used women to do it. So Mary Magdalene, we know Mary, the mother of James the Younger and Joseph. That is Mary, the mother of Jesus. We know that Jesus had four brothers, two of which are James and Joseph. Another one is named Simon and another one is named Judas. And we also know that he has a number of sisters who are not named. But that's, that's Jesus' mama. And then the third one there, it mentions Salome. What I love about verse 41 is that often when we think of Jesus and his ministry, when he would travel around, we think of the disciples following him, right? The, the common the, the 12 men, there were disciples that were women that followed him too. And Mark makes sure to mention this, to give honor to the women that followed and supported Jesus as well. Remember in this moment, Jesus just died on the cross. And where have all his male disciples been? They're in hiding, except for... Uh, John, who who is there, kind of on the outskirts. <sighs> and yet the, the women are able to be right there. Let's keep going because otherwise we're not going to have time to get through this today. Okay, the burial of Jesus. This is what we're mainly focusing in today. It says, verse 42 of Mark 15, when it was already evening because it was the day of preparation, parentheses, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went to Pilate and asked for Jesus's body. There is so much great and specific detail in this. I want us to break it down so that we can really understand because this is just two Bible verses. And, and we might read it and be like, okay, yeah, a certain day Joseph came out and he got Jesus, asked for permission and got Jesus. But there's more, friend, there's more. So let's start with this question. Where would Jesus's body have typically gone? Well, according to Roman crucifixion tradition, they would have stayed on the cross for days their body would have hung up there and it would have been a visual reminder to anyone who dares think about challenging Rome. But there were reasons why that didn't happen. In addition to his body staying up on the cross with a typical Roman thing for days, uh, he also, any of the, the people that were taken off crosses after being crucified, they would have been thrown into a mass criminal grave. They would not be given the respect or honor of a proper burial. Joseph of Arimathea is doing something to ensure that that is not the case for Jesus. The question comes, why did they remove Jesus's body that afternoon? Because, and, and as we'll see, Pilate even makes a note of it that's included here in Mark's account, Pilate is surprised that he has died so quickly which he has. There's another account in another gospel that even talks about the soldiers having to hurry this up a bit because Sabbath. Passover, Sabbath, like this holy, holy holiday in the Jewish community. So in another account, it actually says they took a spear and they pierced the side. Okay. So Jesus is dead. He died pretty fast. This is why, uh, specifically for the Jewish culture, why the body had to come down. I point to Deuteronomy 21. And this is the NASB translation, the New American Standard translation. It says, if a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he's put to death and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. They did not like bodies remaining hanging overnight. It was something that would cause unclean. That's a term. Have you heard ceremonially 
unclean or ceremonially, ceremonially defiled. Have you heard of that? Okay, so what we see here, we see that Jesus' body is starting to come down, but, but Mark mentions the day, and this is really significant. So it says it was already evening. It was the first day of preparation, and then he writes in parentheses, that is the day before the Sabbath. From that little note, along with some of the other notes that Mark puts in, we're led to believe that he's writing to a not Jewish audience because he's making sure to explain things that are written in Aramaic or Hebrew or holidays like this. Cool, huh? All right, that's just a bonus. But the day of preparation is significant. The day of preparation, he writes, it's the day before the Sabbath. Remember, this is also a very holy week. So day before preparation is the day when it's very busy. Why? Because the Sabbath is the day where you're supposed to rest and do no work at all, right? So any work that you need done, especially for the next day, you need to have done today, the day before, the day of preparation. They also called it the day of preparation because that was the day where the Passover lamb would be offered, would be killed and cooked. I put cooked and killed Obviously, killing comes before the, yeah, anyway. Sabbath would begin in the evening. You and I, when we think of days, we think morning is the start of a new day. And then, you know, midnight turns over to a new day. That is not how a Jewish day is given. A Jewish day starts in the evening, like sunset, and then it would go to the following sunset of the next day. So it'd be evening into day. They do that because if you look in the Genesis account, um, that is how it is referred to. And it was evening and it was morning on the, in the days of creation. So what we're seeing is it's still the day of Passover, I mean, of preparation. Preparation, the day of preparation was the day that Jesus had the shams of a trial was formally charged and given the punishment uh, of, of crucifixion by Pilate. It was a day he was actually crucified on the cross and the day he died. All of that was on the day of preparation. Do you see the parallel? The day that the Lamb of God would have been taken and, and killed and offered for the sins of the people. That's that. Really cool. Let's keep going. Regarding the Sabbath, there were things that you could and could not do. And it was spelled out very specifically. Obviously, do no work. That is written in the commandments, right? On the seventh day, you are to rest. And that is an act of submission and... Um, Acknowledgement to God. If God rested on the seventh day and said, everything is good, we are too as well. In the Jewish community, that term, that, that instruction of do not work has been expanded greatly. Not, not in a malicious way, but when, when you're coming together, that saying don't work it seems cloudy. What do you mean by that? What do you mean do not work? Does it mean that you can't cook? They would say, well, yeah. Does it mean that you can't uh, go plow out in your field or harvest or? Yeah. They've actually developed 39 categories of forbidden activity. And this is still in in use today. I was actually watching a video excerpt from a rabbi who was answering questions. Jew Jews would contact him and say, well, what about this? And what about this? Can I do this? Is this breaking a law or not? And the one that was brought up to him that I thought was so interesting was, am I allowed to watch TV on the Sabbath if I put my TV on a timer? Because then I'm not turning it on or off. 
Yeah. Yeah. It is very common in Jewish families today in Jewish households that there are timers for things like lights because they're not supposed to do any work. Uh, interesting side note with this rabbi, he said, no, it would still violate the 39 categories of forbidden activity because also included in that is this idea of not having noise and a TV would be making noise. Therefore, you shouldn't be watching your TV even with a timer where you're not actually turning it on. I know, I know. Really interesting culture, right? And I think it's good for us to, to know and appreciate that culture. We are not bound to these laws, right? We're not bound to these, these laws that come from the Old Testament. We're not under the law of, we're not under the law, period. We're under grace. Flo, did I just say good morning? Good morning, friend. Overall, the whole premise of the Sabbath should be a posture that honors God. It isn't just, at least it's not supposed to be, how can I, you know, navigate the rules to do this, what I want to do, but do it in a way that doesn't break the law. One might say, is that fully a posture that's wanting to honor God, or are you more interested in your own stuff? One of the activities that they could do on the Sabbath was pray and read scripture. They could go to the synagogue. They could do that. But there's a lot that they couldn't do. No work. There were other things that played a role in the Sabbath that come into play specifically through the scripture moment that we're reading about today. And that's this idea of holy, common, clean, and unclean. This was four categories that priests would, would be able to define. And, and it actually ended up, so holy and common. Holy was set apart for God. Common was not set apart for God. So there were holy things and there were common things. And then there was clean and unclean. Something could be holy and clean and common and clean. Or it could be common and unclean. It could never be holy and unclean. It could never be set apart for God and unclean. Those are, are in opposition. But something could be common and clean, common and unclean. They have so much awareness to things that are clean and unclean. When someone had broken one of these clean, unclean laws, these rules, they were considered ceremonially unclean. I'm not going to list all of the ways that someone could become unclean because there are so many, including when a woman, when a woman is uh, having her time of the month, she would be considered ceremonially unclean because of her body fluids coming out of her. The only concession related to body fluids, by the way, was someone could use the bathroom and not be considered. Yeah, yeah. But I do want to point out a couple as they relate to today's text. One, an unclean person could not approach the sanctuary. In fact, they, they were at risk of divine judgment and even death if they disrespected that separation of holy and clean and something that was unclean. An unclean person could not eat consecrated meat, sacrifice to God, nor tithe consecrated food. Think about the Passover. The whole Passover meal, they take a lamb who is consecrated, set apart, and then walks through this process with God of, of being cut, blood spilt, um, there's a portion that's offered in a burnt sacrifice. There's another portion that's offered to the priest. There's a portion that goes home. Someone who's unclean would not get to partake of that. And that includes the Passover meal. An unclean person could not celebrate annual Passover. There is a provision that said you could celebrate it a month later. <laughs> but they would not allow an unclean person to have this moment this significant religious annual moment. And an unclean person, in order to become clean again, they had to go through a purity process. They had to go through a process. It wasn't even just waiting it out. 
they had to go through a process. So a woman every month, as long as she had a cycle, she would have to go through a process to be designated as ceremonially clean again. Alrighty, 20 minutes in. All right, burial specifically is another way that makes people unclean. In fact, anyone who touches a human corpse is made ceremonially unclean for seven days. Seven days. I want you to remember that and think of the people that are now gonna be interacting with Jesus's body that according to the law would have been ceremonially unclean. Now, I, I want to mention to you this idea of the priest being unclean, even though the, the men that we're talking about today were not priests. Joseph of, of Arimathea was not designated as a priest. He was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, which is this highly elevated judging council. But that didn't necessarily mean that you were a priest. They could have been viewed as a, as a rabbi, a teacher, but that's not the same thing as priest. Okay, so priests could only come in contact with the corpse of an immediate family member. And there were even exceptions to that. Like, uh, so a, an immediate family member, mother, father, sister, brother, son, daughter. But there was, there was an article that I read that said, well, but if the sister is not a virgin and not married, she's unclean. And therefore that priest would not have been able even to assist in her burial. Mm -hmm. A high priest could not ever be in the same room with a corpse. The high priest is supposed to be this very holy set apart one, and the priests are supposed to be more set apart than the average person. You see this? There is so many rules and guidelines that, that dictate so much of what this moment is. The fact that it's the day of preparation leading to the Sabbath, which is also in this Passover holiday, right? The fact that it's dealing with a burial. So let's go back to verse 43. So it mentions Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, that high ruling judging council. It says, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God. Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, was a believer. He was a follower of Jesus. They make sure to note that here. And it's good for us to see, even though the Sanhedrin was this large force that moved Jesus to be crucified, it was their agenda, not everyone in the Sanhedrin council Agreed. In fact, there were members of the Sanhedrin who believed and followed Jesus. Now, Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee. A different group would be called a Sadducee, and the Sadducees were the were, were the majority in the Sanhedrin. Pharisees, uh, like Joseph of Arimathea, like Nicodemus, like some others, they were considered a minority. So they did not have as much saying power in the Sanhedrin. In this moment, Joseph comes up and it says that he came and boldly went to Pilate and asked for Jesus's body. Just by doing this, Joseph chose to become ceremonially unclean. That's the choice he's making. And he's also risking a lot to publicly go to claim Jesus's body this guy that the Sanhedrin just declared was a political enemy and like a usurper, a re rebellion, riot starter. You know what I mean? And yet here comes a guy from that group who did not agree with their decision. And I'll, I'll show that to you in a minute. He risked a lot to claim Jesus's body, but he knew that Jesus was innocent and he felt that Jesus was worthy of so much more than an unmarked grave, mass grave full of criminals. So he claims his body. I want to show you this. Um, this is from Luke 23. There was a good and righteous man named Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, verse 51, who had not agreed with their plan and action. 
He was from Arimathea, a Judean town, and he was looking forward to the kingdom of God. So there they acknowledge him as well. And there's just that little bit of detail, right? Luke included specifically stating that Joseph of Arimathea did not agree with the Sanhedrin's majority. Here we go. Both included that he was a believer. Verse 44, Pilate was surprised that he, Jesus, was already dead. Yes, because oftentimes, like, so Jesus was on the cross for about six hours from 9 a.m. till about 3 p.m., maybe 8, 8 to 9, till about 3. So six to seven hours. Hmm. Usually they would hang on for a very long time. It would be very painful. Um, so the fact that Jesus died and it was something that he controlled the wind, profound. So it even caught Pilate off guard. So Pilate summoned the centurion and he asked him whether he had already died. Now this centurion would have been able to say, yes, we, you know, we stuck him with the spear he was gone. We, and then uh, talking about water coming out. Anyway, verse 45. So when Pilate found out from the centurion that Jesus was in fact dead, he gave the corpse to Joseph. Now that when he says he gave, that's, that's just like a proclamation of his authority that Joseph could have the corpse, the body. Verse 46, after he brought some linen cloth, Joseph took him down and wrapped him in the linen. I did dot, 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 because there's more to this verse than that. All four Gospels include Joseph of Arimathea. They include that Joseph took Jesus' body, uh, that he prepared the body for burial, and he buried him in this tomb. Obviously now, Joseph is coming in contact with a corpse. He is now ceremonially unclean given the huge holiday moment, that was a big loss. He can't even share uh, a Sabbath meal with his family. I wanna point to you John's account real quick because John's gospel tells us that Nicodemus was with him. This is from John 19, verse 39. Nicodemus, parentheses, who'd previously come to him at night, come to Jesus at night, do you remember that account? Nicodemus is also a member of the Sanhedrin. He is also a Pharisee. And he, he has been asking really beautiful questions to Jesus to discern. And, and he's drawn to Jesus. Jesus never condemns Nicodemus. He always has these beautiful discussions with Nicodemus, who is so sincere. A lot of times people give a bad name to Nicodemus because he didn't like boldly declare, it wasn't counted him saying during the time of Jesus's life and ministry, I followed Jesus. But we can see from his moment being included in Jesus's burial, we can see his love and desire to honor Jesus. Look what he came with. It says, he also came bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. So where Joseph of Arimathea provided the tomb, that was his tomb, brand new tomb. You can see that if you look more into John's account. I actually, I took it out because I, I knew we wouldn't have time. 75 pounds of myrrh. This is from a, a beautiful... Uh, article that was written for Wisconsin Lutheran, Lutheran Seminary by a guy named John Brug. He says, one liter was an extravagant anointing amount for Jesus. If myrrh was comparable to nard in cost, do you remember when nard was used? The woman who anointed Jesus at Bethany? And you remember that was the pivotal moment where Judas, where Judas was like, that's too extravagant. That could feed people for a year, right? Now Nicodemus is coming and he's brought 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. The perfume Nicodemus brought would be 100 years wages. 
for an average person. Let that sink in. So the question comes, why would Nicodemus willingly offer this much? It's way more than what was necessary for a burial. Why did he do it? Because he believed Jesus was the king. That was a burial worthy of a king. That's who he believed Jesus to be. The king of the Jews, the son of God, the Messiah. So, verse 46, I know we're, we're hitting the 30-minute mark. Verse 46, after he brought some linen cloth, Joseph took him down and wrapped him in the linen. We, we read that a second ago. And then he says that he laid him in a tomb cut out of the rock and rolled against the entrance and rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Now, rather than just, you know, a whole mass grave, Jesus is being offered a tomb cut into stone, which only wealthy people would have had. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy. He also had this tomb cut out and ready. We we believe that 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 was the tomb that he had intended for himself and his family. And now he's willingly giving it up for Jesus. Yeah. Isaiah 53, 9 says this. This is a messianic foretelling through the word of a prophet regarding the coming Messiah, the suffering servant. It says he was assigned a grave with the wicked. That's what he should have gotten, right? But he was with a rich man at his death, Joseph of Arimathea. Because he had not, he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. He was innocent. All right. The last verse today, verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where he was laid. Mark includes this detail because he's building up to something. The next chapter. The key here for us to see is that the women were there with and that would have been very common for the women to likely be with Joseph of Arimathea and with Nicodemus as they are getting his body ready for burial. Uh, the women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, Jesus' mom, and Salome, by being there, they know exactly where the tomb was. They also have been dealing with his dead body, preparing it for burial. Those are key things that are important in their eyewitness account for what they're going to experience which we'll look at tomorrow. Mark 16. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, thank you so much that you provided a way for us. That we are not hopelessly burdened through so many laws that are impossible to be kept. That we are invited through your grace, through the blood of Jesus, to be a part of your family. To be able to be even in your presence. Thank you, Lord. I pray that this moment, this awareness of being clean and unclean, holy and common, the risk that was, that was taken by Joseph of Arimathea and by Nicodemus, but they felt it was worth it to worship and honor the Son of God. I pray that that hits us today. Help us, Lord. Amen. Amen. Do me a favor. Can you hit the share button? Can you invite someone into this habit of getting into scripture on a daily basis? All right, guys, that's it. I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to pick up in the last chapter in the Gospel of Mark. It's chapter 16. I'll see you.